Gladio for Europe. I am Liam, joined as always by Russian Sam. Hello, hello. And today we have a very special guest, a uh, pretty cool friend of mine, somebody who uh, has a pretty cool story and a lot of cool stories to tell, particularly involving the mysterious, exotic, and beautiful U.S. state stolen territory, uh, whatever you want to call it, of Alaska. And this is my friend John in Alaska. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing pretty good today. Uh, I managed to kind of fake a sick day, so I've been enjoying that. Nice, nice. And, uh, you know, without, like, doxing yourself too much, can you tell us what you're faking a sick day from? Because I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, so I've got a job at a school in a remote village in Alaska. Uh, About as specific as I'll Mm -hmm. get is it's, like, on the peninsula. And uh, because I I went to school to be a teacher, and I just finished my student teaching. And uh, I got Mm -hmm. an email from my school about an opportunity to be a tutor at a school in Alaska. So I thought it sounded cool to spend three months out here. And so I got a job as a tutor. Uh, I'm in a town or I don't even want to call it a town. They all call it a village out here. So I'm going to call it a village. It's basically two villages put together Uh and uh, it's like 300 people in the two villages, um, Uh which is apparently a big village out here. Uh, Some of the other villages um, like a, uh-huh. a village where they just they're trying to get me to work next year. It has like a hundred people there, mm-hmm. and then some of the villages have like fifty people there. So there's some villages that are like like three families or whatever, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. all the families are pretty big too. Like all the families are like eight eight or nine. Oh people. wow, that's old school. I don't think I've ever been anywhere that small. Uh, the smallest town I've ever been in prior to this was like my college town. I went to WSU. Um, and that that town was like basically like most of the population was just like people that went to the college and the rest of it was just like wheat farms. But even that was like a big town compared to this. Like this is like super isolated. Like the town's only accessible by plane. Um, and that's in Southern California. So you really you, you went from like one side of the West Coast to the other. It's, yeah. It's a pretty, pretty big change. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess uh, the main thing is that we just kind of we know that you have some kind of cool stories about life in Alaska, about your work, you know, about like how, how you're liking it. And especially because this is a history podcast about Alaska's history, which is a, a lot of interesting stuff to get into. I've never been to Alaska. I've never dived too deep into Alaskan history myself. I know like the broadest strokes, but you obviously know a lot more than me. Uh, Sam, have you ever been to Alaska? I need to be to Russia a couple times. Have you ever like crossed the Bering Strait? Uh, nope, nope, never been to Alaska. My knowledge of the place <laughs> is limited to trivia, unfortunately, but thankfully we have John uh. <laughs> here to help us uh, make sense of this whole thing. What goes on in Alaska? We're about to find out. Yeah, so I mean, I guess just a funny story about coming out here was that like, because uh, they told me how I, ha- I would have to like ship food in because like the town's only accessible by plane and it's basically like buying stuff from the grocery oh, wow. store like it's cheaper to ship stuff in because the grocery store has to sh- ship it in anyways uh-huh. so like you're just paying to ship it in plus like a markup yeah um it's crazy oh yeah but i guess i just did it in like a really stupid way because like i genuinely thought like oh i'm gonna buy a bunch of stuff in washington where i live and then like ship it out but funny, funnily enough, Amazon still has free shipping out here, so it would have been way smarter to just order stuff on Amazon and ship it out. That's funny. Wait, yeah. So I, I basically wasted like a ton of money doing that, uh, but mm-hmm. I still, I don't know, it adds to the fun because I'm like rationing yeah. food out. <laughs> the adventure, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I've heard that uh, because like, you know, it's so far out from everything that buying a hamburger in Alaska, like at a restaurant, it's like 20 bucks or more. Is that true? Uh, Yeah, it's gen- like, I mean, I think it genuinely was like even in Anchorage, it was like I got like a burrito and it, I mean, it was a fairly big burrito, but the burrito was like mm-hmm. $16 or something like that. And Anchorage is going to be like the cheapest yeah, place yeah, you yeah, can go yeah, in so. Alaska, basically. Yeah, yeah, that would be high so even by New York puts, standards, like, for the record. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Great. Gonna say, it even puts LA to shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so kind of just like a, Anchorage is like a relatively big city, right? Like probably bigger than some Americans might think. Yeah, it's bigger than I, I, the metro area is like four hundred thousand people, I think. Um, and it's something like sixty yeah. percent of yeah, the population lives in Anchorage, basically. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that, that's a crazy concentration. Yeah, yeah, because like I said, like, this is, like, one of the bigger villages around here, apparently. Um, and there's just, like, so many, like, towns that are just, like, 50 people or whatever, like, scattered around the state that are, like, only accessible by plane. And it just makes me think of, like, how the hell do people, like, like, because it, it feels weird enough, like, like, the difficulties of living out here, but this is, like, one of the cushier places everybody's been telling me, so. Yeah. So, obviously, you know, Alaska, very far from the mainland contiguous U.S., but it is still part of the, you know, the U.S. I think it was the, the 49th state to be admitted. I think it was before Hawaii. It was admitted at the same time as Hawaii, I believe. Yeah, I think it's still technically Hawaii is considered the 50th state. I don't really know why. Maybe it's just like they did it mm -hmm. one, they did Alaska one day mm -hmm. and then Hawaii the next. But for, from everything I know, Alaska was the 49th state. But they were basically admitted yeah. at the same time. I know it was definitely, you know, like colonized, acquired, whatever you want to say, by the U.S. before Hawaii was. Um, and I know that, like, you know, obviously, you know, Alaska becoming part of the U.S. is, like, you know, not historically inevitable. It was contingent on a lot of interesting conflicts that I feel like people outside of Alaska don't really know about. How, like, uh, the the Spanish and the, and the uh, Russians and the British and the Amer Americans were all vying for this same huge chunk of land and yeah it was really a free-for-all yeah and the the various indigenous peoples the yupik the inuit were all caught in the middle yeah like it basically comes down to like when they took when the u.s took control of alaska it was basically just because uh russia and the uk were in like such a strong rivalry at the time like it has to do with like the great game and stuff like that like them vying over central asia yeah and basically yeah. russia just thought it was a good mm -hmm. way to screw over the uk mm -hmm. because they weren't sure how well they would be able to hold on uh -huh. to alaska because they didn't have the same access to it that yeah, like yeah. america had so they basically just thought it was a good way yeah. to screw over the brits to give alaska to america or sell it i guess and if you don't mind john would you mind if we re uh, rewind a little bit and talk about how how russia gained a foothold in alaska in the first place? uh yeah sure um I mean, it basically just comes down to, like, they kept marching east to get through Siberia, and then um, by the time they got to the coast, like, because it, it's, like, remarkably close. I mean, even today, like, the end of, like, Ru Russia still controls, like, one of the islands in the Aleutian chain, and, um, yeah, like, it's really, they're really not that far apart, and it... I, I believe it was the fur trade is what made them come out initially. Yeah, yeah, there was pretty regular contact, even in in uh, pre-European times, from what I understand. Well, yeah, like, like the Yupik languages are spoken on both sides of uh, of the like, Bering Straits. They're spoken in, in eastern Russia and in western Alaska. Yeah, yeah, the native people, like, there wasn't much of a divide, like, even after the, what do you call it, the Bering Strait uh, opened up. Yeah. Uh, basic. Yeah. Basically, there's still a lot of contact in between, like, Alaskan people and, like, uh, Siberian people. And even, like, there's still yeah. not that big of a difference ethnicity-wise between them. Yeah, no, the languages are super close. And I remember, like, I, I read a while back that, like, mm -hmm. there, was, uh, there was, like, sporadic yeah. contact uh, from, like, deeper in Siberia into Alaska. And I know, like, um, some Alaska, native Alaskan cultures wear this pretty cool armor uh, that they use for fighting polar bears. Uh, which had come over from Siberia. And then maybe even more kind of exciting is that, do you guys remember when they found that Venetian bead? You know about this? Oh, yes, yes. I've heard about this. I haven't heard about this. I want to hear about it. Sometime, uh, sometime a while back, yeah, um, uh, an Alaskan gravesite was unearthed. I believe it was a gravesite um, where they found this glass bead that seemed to be of European origin. And when they dated it, it turned out that it had, uh, it was a medieval glass bead that had come to Alaska certainly before Europeans got to Alaska and probably before Columbus got to the Americas at all, which suggests it was a, a bead from Venice that traveled all the way across the Silk Road from Italy into China and then presumably through China up through Northern Asia all across Siberia before eventually landing in the pocket of some Inuit guy who probably didn't know how far away it came from but knew it was this like cool exotic foreign object. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Mm -hmm. We talked about that book, uh, 1491, yeah. uh, which is pretty a pretty cool overview of indigenous like pre-Columbian culture. And one thing that the author took pains to underline, which I never really considered before, is that a lot of uh, discussion about Native American trade sort of uh, 
is a little bit too patronizing and condescending to indigenous peoples. It really emphasizes the ways that they might have been like tricked or fooled by, you know, buying these worthless trinkets. But what that perspective forgets is that a trinket that might have been worthless to European settlers could have had a lot of cultural and uh, political value to indigenous peoples because it shows, look, I have connections to foreigners. You got to respect me. I can like access goods from across the ocean. Having that glass bead might have been a pretty cool display of power in that place and time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, even though the distance itself is striking, there's nothing really unusual about this. From what I understand, there were trade networks uh, from coast to coast of North America for thousands of years, basically. People have been um, moving and trading across these routes for uh, for for much, 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 much longer than Europeans ever heard of America. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So let's lead us through, like we were talking about, like uh, if you could lead us through how exactly the Russians got to Alaska and eventually how did that lead to the U.S. making Alaska the 48th or the 49th state? Right. Okay. So in the uh, 16th century, Russia was in the process of transitioning from uh from a regional state into an empire proper. And as part of that, uh, this meant, first of all, that they were going to uh, uh, militarily defeat uh, the neighboring states that, uh, you know, were on their borders and yeah. who had been uh, causing a lot of trouble for uh uh, for the people yeah. who lived there for uh, for centuries. Rest in like, peace, Siberian Khanate. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, those guys sure love to slave raid. But anyway, the Russians uh, from the like 16th century onwards, the, suddenly there was this frontier opening up in a process that's kind of analogous to the United States, where at first it was basically serfs uh, who were running away from their masters as uh, the chains of feudalism were getting tighter. They started heading out where the authorities weren't. And of course that happened to be out East. And, and initially this was an annoyance, but pretty quickly uh, uh, the Russian state realized that this could be a great asset to actually expand the footprint uh, of Russia. So uh, there's a lot of history to go in here, but suffice it to say that by the uh, that by the 18th century, Russia was right by the tip of uh, of the Eurasian landmass. They were stopped at an area called Chukotka for nearly a century. Uh, and uh, uh, the inhabitants of, of Chukotka, they're called the Chukchi. Uh, today in, in Russia, they're primarily known for being the butt of jokes about how uh, dumb they are, unfortunately. But like not dumb in like stupid way it's like there's a cleverness to them that's simple but uh profound in a way but anyway uh these people they were able to hold off the russian troops for over a century they were very very fierce warriors not nice guys and ultimately the only reason why uh they ultimately came to an agreement with russia where they would uh recognized the Tsar as their sovereign, but they were still exempt from paying taxes because they just, you know, weren't the kinds of people that you do that to. They had held their own for a century against uh, European power, so they were kind of respected. And so with Chukotka integrated, this was right at the end of the 18th century. Yeah. Suddenly... Uh, you're at the you're at the Bering Strait and yeah. right across the water and, is Alaska. And I just want to add here, this is not that it's like only a few years before, uh, from the American perspective, you'd have Lewis and Clark reaching the Pacific from the other side. So it's around the same time you have these kind of parallel colonial processes, both very bad for the local people living there, in which these, you know, powers sort of originating in Europe in a sense, both come basically converge uh, on the Pacific. Yeah. Right, and you know, the one other thing I know about uh, Russian settlement of the Russian Far East is that in 1825, there was the Decemberist Revolt, where a bunch of liberals, a lot of them actually coming from the aristocratic, you know, sector of society, who were dissatisfied with the Tsar, tried to change society, didn't quite work out, so they all got sent off to the Far East, and these guys, the Decemberists, not the band, uh, they would start have this little kind of cultural flourishing in the Russian Far East, and eventually some of them would land in Alaska. And the first major Russian settlement in Alaska uh, was this pre-existing indigenous community, uh, I think of Tlingit people, 
not in actually not even in the part that's closest to Russia, but in the part that's closer to uh, mainland Canada, which is Sitka, Alaska, which they named New Arkhangelsk, named after another city in western Russia that's probably just, as from what I understand, just as icy. Oh yeah, that place is freezing. Uh, my grandmother, she uh, did her post university uh, like um, experience up there. It was not a great place after the war. Let's say that much. Yeah. And also, so John, so you mentioned the Great Game earlier. So you know, like uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is that uh, by founding this city up again, right up against the border with Canada, the Russians were sort of a uh, you know making a statement to the British, who of course owned Canada at this time. You know, West British Columbia, Western Canada, was incredibly sparsely populated, as our friend Jim uh, could tell us at this point. So I don't think they were actually much of a threat to British settlements, but it certainly was this interesting challenge to British colonial ambitions, right? Yeah, and I mean, they even made trading posts as far down as California, from what I understand. Like, there are, and interestingly enough, there's like, uh, yes, uh, in, yeah. Inuit martyrs because of people that traveled with the uh, Russian settlers and they basically ended up fighting some Sp like either Spanish or like British uh, colonists and then ended up becoming martyrs in the yeah. Orthodox church. Yep. No, you yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you know, one thing you see in California in some places is that there are like, I think like for instance, Santa Barbara, uh, no, yeah, Santa Barbara, they have all these flags for every nation that's ever claimed the city. So a lot of times it's like, it'll always be the Mexican flag, the California Republic flag, the Spanish flag. But in some places, uh, they have the Russian flag there too, because there was a brief period where the Russian empire claimed control over that part of Alaska. And I know that for, with uh, the uh, the native connect, collect connection with the native martyrs, um, I think in, the, in one case, it was that uh, a whole bunch of, uh, I believe, Aleutian people who were otter hunters would travel with Russian sailors all the way up and down the coast of Pacific America, looking for otters. And on one occasion, they had a run-in with some Spanish settlers, uh, as well as some local Californian indigenous people, and the, uh, the, the Aleutians were killed. And because the Aleutians had become Orthodox Christians, they are now remembered as Orthodox Christian saints. Is, uh, is, is Alaska still very, like, is there still much of, like, a Russian, like, you know, cultural presence? Like, are there still you know, Russian Orthodox people in indigenous communities? Yeah, there's not much of a Russian cultural presence, I would say, but there is definitely, like, the Orthodox Church is still pretty big, because, uh, like, where I'm living, it's mostly Native Alaskans, and, um, like, the only church here is, like, a big, like, it looks like any other Orthodox church, um, and people are still pretty religious out here. Um, like, you hear kids talking about going to Bible camp and stuff like that, like, a lot. Um, but yeah, like the church is basically like a standard Orthodox church. They have like some Greek guy that's like the priest for the town that kind of like flies around between the different villages to like <laughs> bless it at different points. That's crazy. And, so is it like formally part of the Russian Orthodox church or is it its own offshoot? I, I think because I th if I remember correctly, I think basically what happened is that like after the Soviet Union took over, uh -huh. uh, the Orthodox Church, like it used to be a lot more closely connected with the Russian Orthodox Church. But after the Soviet Union, they kind of gave a lot yeah. more uh, independence towards like the American version of the Orthodox Church just because there was like more religious freedom or uh -huh. whatever. And um so nowadays yeah. it's not very connected. Like they don't speak Russian in the church or whatever. Like they they speak English. Um, the mm -hmm. the it mainly it's mainly just in looks in terms of like how Russian it actually is. Like it looks like a Russian church and like like oh the, the icons the onion yeah domes. yeah they have the icons and the onion domes. Yeah. yeah, and for the record, I don't think that uh, this would have been a move that the Soviets would have made unilaterally from their part. More likely, there was pressure uh, on the ground for these people to dissociate uh, from the Russian Orthodox Church, which was now in Soviet hands. Yeah. Was this, do you think this was by like random Russian immigrants, emigres in America, or was the CIA or the State Department straight up telling native Alaskans that they have to break ties with the Soviets? What do you think? I'm pretty I, sure I, it would have just guys. been white Russians, honestly. I don't uh -huh, think that uh -huh. uh, any security agencies would have cared that deeply <laughs> yeah. if some Native Alaskans are going to uh, 
uh, to a to an Orthodox church that yeah. formally uh, is within the church hierarchy that's controlled by the Soviet Union. Do you know anything about like how how bad were the Russians in Alaska, John? Like, do, do you, I I assume it's probably I'm going to assume it's not a great even though they're if the people are still Orthodox today. Despite that, I'm still I'm going to bet it's probably not a very warm cultural memory. Yeah, I mean, it's basically, like, I mean, it's the same as any other European settlers, really. Like, uh, like I know, because I've, like, kind of been in classes where they're learning about, like, like, they call it, like, cultural standards or whatever. Um, it has to do with, like, how the classes are set up. And, um, like, they talk a lot about, like, different uh, massacres that happened. Um, like, there was one at, uh... I think it was Kodiak Island. Like it wasn't called Kodiak Island back then, obviously, but it was, there was some revolt and basically they led, they like got one of the tribes to like massacre the other and it killed like 10,000 people or something like that. So there's, there's still a lot of like really bad. Yeah. So there's still like a lot of really bad uh, cultural memories of that, but they, which probably makes sense as to why like, you don't see much like Russian oh, yeah. culture that stuck around, but you do see the religious aspect kind of sticking around. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, right. Yeah, actually, I realized now I've heard this before, and it's 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 you know it's, it's the, a good way to frame this is that I think it, I, I from what I understand among modern indigenous communities, it's called the Wounded Knee of Alaska. Like that's how this event is is commemorated, but it was not it was not a massacre committed by American white settlers, but by Russians. Yeah. Yeah, and it was pretty messed up because it took place over like ten years or something like that. Like they basically just like blockaded the island and like slowly wiped them out. Wow, it makes you kind of realize that uh, colonial. There's no way to do colonialism that isn't brutal and genocidal. You know, yeah. like I, some colonial situations might be worse than others, but if you're trying to economically and socially dominate these communities it basically inevitably is going to lead to massacre because there's going to be resistance and the best way to put down resistance is by starving people out and killing people who resist. This happens like, you know, time and time again all over the Americas and many other parts of the world. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, yeah, like you said, it just, it turns out if you're going to try to make it so that you're forcing the people of one area to enrich people of another area, like it's probably not going to turn out well, (laughs) so. Yeah. Like, economic exploitation always ends up pretty fucked up. And from what I understand, ultimately, all of this, you know, brutality committed by by the Russians would basically be for nothing, right? Because they would, there would not be a permanent Russian presence in Alaska. Pretty quickly, they would sell this territory to the U.S. I know famously it happened, uh, I want to say in Lincoln's administration, it might have been Grant's, right? But it was like around the time of the Civil War, right after I think it was right at the end of the Civil War. That was the Johnson administration. But yeah, all right. So clearly I am out of my depth here. Uh, you two guys, uh, let, why don't you share what you can about how exactly this territory, which which Russia clearly was willing to kill thousands of people to keep a hold of, ended up moving into American hands. Yeah, well, basically, I think essentially what happened is that like a lot of the fur trade um it kind of went by the wayside because like the fur trade was mainly had to just do with fashions back in europe and those fashions kind of died out eventually um like if any of you have ever seen the movie first cow which is a movie that i really love like they talk about uh it's set in the oregon territory yeah with the yeah ali shakat yeah and they uh like they're talking like there's a scene where these two british aristocrats are talking about the fashion back in europe and they're just like oh yeah the fashion's kind of dying out now but of course it's oh this fur trade's gonna last forever and also we're never gonna run out of beavers and stuff like that um but basically what happened is that the fashion died out and fur wasn't as popular anymore um so The fur trade kind of died out, and that was basically the total of what Russia was doing to uh, kind of make money off of Alaska. And on top of that, like, they didn't, their eastern seaboard wasn't, like, nearly as well-maintained as, like, the western seaboard in America. So their access to Alaska wasn't really, like, as strong as it was, as strong or as useful as it was for America. And like I was saying— Yeah, no, and and I think that's still kind of, yeah— that's still part of like armchair Russia analysis today. The whole thing about how like they don't have a warm water port because all the ports in the Russian Far East are frozen half the year. 
Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the, the ports in Alaska are frozen, too. Like, I, I mean, it, it sounds stupid, but I was, like, blown away by just, like, how frozen everything was when I got here. Just because, like, I knew it was cold, but I just didn't realize, like, that, like, literally everything was frozen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, yeah you're, you're, in the, you're in the Arctic Circle, you know, like, uh, uh, John, I know you from uh, a chat with some people in Northern Europe, and it's kind of funny that you're probably, like, significantly closer to them in like finland and scotland than you are to me in la yeah even though you're in the u.s well yeah because it also blew my mind just how far away alaska is from the rest of yeah. america because i like it was like a four-hour flight from seattle over to here or over to anchorage and that's like a longer flight than it is from seattle to san diego which is a flight i make a lot because i grew up in san diego and i live in seattle now mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they're farther apart, like Alaska is farther apart from like the northern U.S. than like the northern U.S. is from the southern U.S. Yeah. So it's like very, very far away. Wow. Um. But yeah, back, but yeah, back on the topic of just like kind of how uh, America ended up acquiring it. Um, it really just has to do with uh, like it was hard to maintain Alaska. And with uh, Russia losing out on, like, naval dominancy compared to the UK, they were really worried about the UK taking Alaska and then having, uh, like, a really strong, like, basically, because if they take Alaska, then they would have this territory that's right next to Russia. And they were kind of afraid, which I'm not sure how valid of a fear it is, but they were kind of afraid in the same way that, like, the Brits were afraid of Russia taking Central Asia to invade India which was always a stupid fear. Like they, Russia was kind of afraid of like the Brits using Alaska as a jumping off point to like invade Russia, which so also Siberia. seems like a stupid fear yeah, because yeah. it's like, then they would have to march all the way through which, Siberia. Yeah, that, that, that would have been you know, hilarious to see, you know, uh, especially given how like, you know, it, going from like France to Moscow is probably like a third of the distance as a, uh, alaska to moscow yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know how that worked out so it's very funny to imagine the british army all these guys from like you know cardiff and <laughs> norfolk having to march on foot you know from alaska <laughs> all yeah. the way across the entirety of siberia yeah yeah who knows maybe a guy or two will make it yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah you know it's uh yeah the, i feel like if people love you know having like those kinds of imperial anxieties in any kind of like you know big state conflict like uh how like you know like uh, should I think of another example like um, uh, I believe at the start of World and like you know crazy ambitions at the start of World War One I, I think uh, the German Empire was convinced that winning World War One would allow them to take over somehow take over all of Italy that that would be next there's one guy in the German high command who seemed to think that. But all right, uh, let's say, yeah, so, 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 yeah, so let's talk about, so, uh, eventually it becomes American, uh, we said it happens in the Johnson administration, why did the U.S., I get why Russia didn't want Britain at their doorstep, but why did the U.S. want this territory? Okay, yeah, uh, I mean, basically, the biggest reason, like, the most immediate reason is, like, a pretty funny reason in my, uh, at least to me, because it sounds really stupid to us, but, like, the biggest reason why was because they wanted the ice in Alaska. Because basically, they want it, uh, like, California... Literally, so physically the ice, like, the ice itself. Yeah, they literally wanted the ice because, like, the ice trade was really huge back then because they didn't have refrigeration. So they needed ice for ice boxes. Um, so they... in Alaska so had funny. so much ice. But, like, the yeah. problem with, like, the way they were shipping ice to the West Coast before, because, like, California was, like, starting to have, like, major population rises... And the Northwest to, like, a much lesser extent, yeah. but, like, mainly California. Right, right. Yeah, because um, yeah. this is 1867, and just for a little bit of context here, 1848, obviously, is the California gold rush. And that is when a huge amount of Americans started moving into California territory. When California was part of Mexico, it actually had a very sparse European or colonial population. It was overwhelmingly indigenous. Uh, suddenly, when they find gold... All these gringos and all these Mexicans, too, start moving into California with pretty bad results for the people, the indigenous people already living there. And uh, so then you, you, you got a lot of people, a lot, they need a lot of food, and to preserve food in a hot climate, you got to have ice. 
Yeah, yeah, and basically what they had to do before, because this was before the Panama Canal as well, so what they would have to do is they would ship ice, yeah. because there also still wasn't reliable railroads that ran, like, all the way across, like, to the west, so they yeah. would ship ice uh, uh, yes. mm-hmm. on sea and go all the way around uh, the southern cone and then come back up and then deliver it yeah. to California. Um, and that kind of has yeah. to do with goods in general, which is another thing that's kind of yeah, funny yeah. is because basically California in the West was like kind of similar to what Alaska is like now, where it's just so far out of the way that it leads to things being like insanely more expensive and just like harder yeah. to live out here because it's like out of the way from all the normal shipping routes. Um, yeah. so, but basically, so Alaska was a really good way to get ice to California without having to like go so far out of the way to get so it basically made it so ice could be a lot cheaper in california yeah was kind of the and, you know, what's hilarious is that you know yeah this has been a pretty good year for rain in california but usually california is pretty dry so even 150 years later the I, the state of government the, the state government of california is still purchasing water from canada and alaska because yeah. you guys have a lot we don't have too much let's make a deal yeah. And yeah, and so that's also the funny thing here is that I remember in like, yeah, the one thing you learn about Alaska in the US is that when they bought Alaska, it was called, it was nicknamed Sewer's Icebox. And I didn't realize until today that it literally was because of the ice. That's, that's very funny to me. It wasn't just a joke. Yeah, like it genuinely what like people made fun. That was kind of how people made fun of it back then. But it was genuinely one of the best reasons to do it. Because like I said, like ice was such a big trade back then. And, like, so much of Alaska is basically all ice that it makes it, like, this massively profitable trade. Um, But on top of that, even, like, they did know about, like, a lot of resources in Alaska besides just ice. Like, they knew about it prior to uh, America purchasing Alaska. Like, they knew about, like, the gold reserves. It's basically just, like, the Russians didn't have, like, the capability to be able to exploit those resources. So that's kind of why you see the gold rush happen like pretty soon after Alaska gets acquired is because they did know that there was like gold and I think maybe oil, but that one I'm not too sure about. But they definitely knew about the gold that was out here. Yeah, and there's also another really interesting geopolitical angle over here, namely that this purchase was really concocted as part of a plan that was supposed to end with the United States getting British Columbia. That was ultimately uh, the dream. In fact, uh, what? Right. That, that's why, yeah, that's why it's like awkwardly not connected to the rest of the country. Yeah, yeah. yeah because yeah. The, the... Yeah, the border over there between the U.S. and uh, Canada was only demarcated in 1848, I believe. Uh, or something like that. Um, yeah, that was the whole, yeah, you know, it was all like 48, 40 or fight. Like, uh, I think it was Polk who made a really big stink about uh, getting like a much bigger chunk of Oregon. And then he gave up. And so <laughs> it's like, you know, Ryan, all right. Um, you know, one thing I also want to add on to is that you talked yeah. about how Russia- And it's like the one uh-huh. American nationalist. No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, it's like the one American nationalist view that I like to give myself is that I still do think we honestly should have <laughs> British Columbia just because I like British Columbia. And uh, I, don't, I don't like having uh, to use my passport to go to Vancouver or whatever. <laughs> Jim, do not listen to this episode. Now would be a good time to remind our listeners that the views of our guests are not necessarily the views of uh, the Gladys. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, back on that point about how Russia, uh, the Russian government wasn't really capable of, of properly exploiting the uh, the natural resources of Alaska, you know, despite how much blood they spilled trying to do so. That reminds me a lot of California at this time, because uh, in a very similar situation, the Mexican government was pretty brutal in California towards indigenous peoples in hopes of controlling the territory. But despite that, there was never enough of a population base to really get at the resources of California. First, the gold, and then once the irrigation got there, the great, you know, agricultural potential. So it wasn't really until the U.S., which was, which had a closer population base to California and also a closer population base to Alaska, was re- that until you really got to see that kind of exploitation happening. And again, it was once these, it was once huge amounts of settlers came over, not just, you know, parties of explorers and soldiers, that things really got bad for indigenous peoples. First in California, and then not too long after in Alaska, first with the ice craze and then the Alaska gold rush. What do you know about the Alaska gold rush? That's like, that's like a thing you learn about in high school. I know that they called some city the Paris of the North, but I don't really know like 
anything else? Um, yeah, I mean, I honestly, I don't know too much about the gold rush to be, yeah, to be honest, I just don't know that much about it. Basically, I just know that there was okay. a gold rush and it was no in worries. Yukon. Yeah. That's kind of about the extent of it that I know. No worries. Well, th- then let- let's skip over that then. And, uh, cause I know there's one thing that one story you want to talk about, which is a story that some of our listeners might know about, but I think it's kind of cool because it, it shows a lot about, Alaskan history and kind of modern Alaskan society, the way that it's a, it's for geographic and historical reasons, it's very different from the rest of the country. Infrastructure, travel, and access to goods, like you said, are really limited in a way that's not really comprehensible to anybody in the contiguous U.S. And I know that a really interesting part of this is the story of the first Iditarod race, the, you know, famous bobsled race, because it seems like that kind of, uh, that reveals a lot about what makes Alaska unique if you could you know if you want to you know lead us off with that story yeah yeah so basically the Iditarod Trail for those that don't know it's like this big dog sledding race that they have every year it starts in Anchorage and it ends in Nome which are uh let me find the exact distance right now but it's a huge distance because Alaska is like mind-boggling big um but, like, it goes from Iditarod to... Yeah, so it's a 1,000 miles. So the, it's this dog sledding race that's a 1,000 miles long that goes from Anchorage to Rome, Nome. And um, basically the way that it got started was that there was a diphtheria pandemic in, in Nome back then, which, like, back then it was, like, a couple hundred people. Um, and diphtheria was curable yeah. by and that still, point. And still, Nome only has, like, I think 4,000 today. Yeah, uh-huh. it's a little, uh-huh. I think it's, like, 3,500. Um, and so, so would the, the the people of Nome at this time, would it, would this, is, was this an indigenous settlement or were these settlers? Like, who were the people dying of diphtheria who needed medical attention in the 20s? Uh, these would be mostly settlers, if I if I understand right. Like, because I don't think there were very many. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, because I think Nome was one of the places where they either had a gold rush or it was just a big fishing town. Um, because I know, like, kind of the whole west coast of Alaska has, like, really big fishing. Yeah. Uh, things going on like to this day um so if i had to guess it was mainly settlers and at the very least the movie that i watched about it uh because i was watching a movie about it in one of the classes uh that i am helping out oh yeah Uh, Uh, togo right yeah togo like it it mainly just showed settlers yeah yeah because everyone knows about balto the famous sled dog but from what i understand balto kind of a clout fiend and really togo was the dog sled <laughs> that should have the does sled dog that should have got all the credit so so, yeah, so yeah, please togo explain, was uh, the lunch pail dog yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so 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 let's correct the record here tell us tell us the story of togo and not that goddamn fraud balto get out of here this is togo togo town here yeah so togo was the original lead sled dog that helped it like so this was back in 1925 um And basically, there wasn't any Grand Alaskan Highway. The Grand Alaskan Highway was built in, I think, the 50s or the 60s. Um, And there wasn't any railroad connecting Anchorage to Rome. So they had to do a dog... And it was in the middle of winter. um, Like, because it's a lot easier to get through Alaska during the summer, obviously. Because everything melts and... Yeah. It becomes... Yeah. But, so, it was all ice. And they had to basically get this serum um all all the way from anchorage to nome and like it's really a similar story to kind of how like the first marathon got started like it's just like this big trek in in between yeah yeah yeah, it was yeah Mm -hmm. yeah that's a great point It it was a rush out of necessity yeah yeah basically and so uh obviously there's a really long indigenous history of sled dogs being used to transport goods not just in alaska but all over the all over north america basically because as because dogs were the only domesticated animals uh, in in the modern in like you know the modern United States before Columbus. Yeah, yeah, it's really big out here. And on a slightly depressing note, like it's been a lot harder for them to do it in recent years because the, like because of climate change, like there's just not as much snow. So like the area I'm yeah. in, like dog sledding was huge, but they haven't been able to dog sled for the past like six yeah, years. Yeah, something I find especially interesting, which kind of gets to the story of the Iditarod itself, is that um uh. The Inuit cultures are incredibly far-reaching. We eventually we should we should do a whole episode on Inuit history. Just so cool, and uh, I know a few Inuit people on Twitter who you know it's, I've learned a lot from them. But one thing I think is super interesting is that 
Inuit cultures go as far east as Greenland, right? Like all the way from uh, like the Yupik people you were talking about in eastern Siberia all the way to Greenland, which is insane, all over North America. And so because of that, due to the fact mm-hmm. that Greenland uh, on two different occasions would become under the possession of Scandinavian people, you know, first Icelandic settlers and then eventually the kingdom of uh, Denmark, Scandinavians had some exposure to the practice of sled dogs, which were introduced in Greenland from all the way over in, like, you know, Siberia and Alaska when the Inuit crossed over. And so this means that uh, when Europeans came to Alaska, some of them were people of Scandinavian origin who had some previous exposure to this cultural practice of sled dog racing because decades, centuries before, other Scandinavians in Greenland had learned about this practice, which means that the guy who was, I guess, the musher, you'd say, of the uh, of Togo, he himself was this uh, Finnish and Norwegian guy, which I think is kind of interesting. Le- Lenhart Sepala. And so he was the guy who uh, who was with uh, Togo on the, on the original Iditarod. I mean, it's just crazy, like, the level of spread that there is uh, with, like, the culture, like, with how far spread out it is. Yeah, yeah, and um, so basically, you know, like you said, like, uh, dog sledding was really big, like, with indigenous cultures, and it's kind of just something that the settlers, like, learned out of necessity just because it was genuinely, like, it's like snowmobiles before there were snowmobiles. Although I guess they call them snow machines out here, which is kind of weird. Um, but, uh, so it's no machine before it was a snow machine. Um, but, uh, so he, he gets it and I mean, basically from there, it's just kind of like this long, like treacherous journey, because from what I remember, it was like towards the end of winter too, um, which makes it a lot more dangerous because like a lot of the ice is starting to break up. Um, and he basically had to go over like a lot of frozen lakes and I think he went over like the frozen sea at one point. Yeah. And, um, yeah, just so like, yeah. So a lot of the ice was breaking up and that just makes it a lot more treacherous to get through. Um, but he basically was able to do it. And I think the original person that got sick from it, uh, still ended up dying, but basically they still were able Mm -hmm. to get. Uh, they were able to get the serum there to get enough people to be cured in time enough for it to not kill basically like the entire town. Cause it probably would have just wiped out the whole settlement if they didn't get it there. Yeah, no, yeah, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. And that, 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 that's how precarious life was, you know, in, in Alaska. And, you know, as you said, even today, it seems like there's so, there's so much dependence on air travel. It sounds like it's still really precarious. Yeah, like, I definitely wouldn't want to get seriously injured out here. Like, because, I mean, I know, for example, at the school, like, they teach kids how to, like, do a tourniquet and stuff like that. Because it's just, like, like, there is a clinic here. Wow. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, like, I don't know how, like, I don't know how much the clinic could actually do. Like, I'm sure they can, like, prescribe stuff. But even getting stuff prescribed, it's, like, they have to fly it in. And it's just, uh, yeah, like, it's a, it's. Yeah, it would be a big deal to get seriously injured out here is basically what what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. You know, one, one last thing I know about Togo, which I think is kind of interesting, is that uh, uh, the name is a, a Sami word. Um, the, the guy, uh, the guy who was ethnically Finnish, he was not Sami, but he just named the dog after like, I think it's, I think it's just Sami for dog uh, after the Sami people of Scandinavia. Uh, but uh, kind of funnily enough, for some reason, he decided actually after he already named the dog this name, he uh, was reading a book about, like, he was reading the recent uh, stories of recent Japanese history, and he was really impressed with how well the uh, the Japanese did just, like, a decade, maybe 20 years before in the uh, Russo-Japanese War. So he decided, actually, I'm changing, the, I'm changing the origin of Togo's name. It's not a Sami name anymore. He's named after Admiral Togo, who uh, defeated the Russians at the Battle of Tsushima. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god Which i think it's kind of funny uh and interestingly uh yeah uh balto also was a it was a uh driven by a norwegian guy so it's kind of i feel like you don't really think of like scandinavian influence in alaska but i guess during the gold rush at the end of the 20th end of the 19th century i guess there would have been a lot of scandinavian guys you know familiar with the climate who uh who wanted to go over 
Well, I do have some very fun Balto and Togo facts for you guys. Are you ready? Oh, please. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's, yeah, let's, uh, you know, let's, yeah, let's oh, finish yeah, up with ahead. that. Yeah, 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 please. All right. Yeah. Well, from what I understand, both dogs are currently taxidermied and on display in uh, various regional mm. museums. So you can actually, you know, see what these guys look like. See Balto and Togo today. Yeah, yeah you know, flash. maybe you need to compare them. Yeah, see, see who's prettier, who really, who, who should really get the, get the claim for stopping the diphtheria outbreak. I'm going to have to say that Balto was the prettier dog. Yeah. Yeah, and just speaking of taxidermy, uh, like one of the funny things when you get into Alaska, like in the Anchorage airport, they just have like all these giant taxidermy bears and like wolves and stuff like that, like on display in the airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what other yeah. are you going to pick up over there? Which I guess also, I don't know how much this is related to taxidermy. But uh, when I first showed up, this guy was showing me around and he was like showing me like this freezer, like he's showing me this freezer and he's like, oh, yeah. And like there's a bunch of old salmon in here. You can have as much of that as you want. And they just points to one of the bags and he's like, don't touch that bag. That's a bear's head. And I'm just like, I don't really get why there's a bear's head in the freezer. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, that's awesome. Well, I, you know, I've heard uh, yeah. as, a, as a kid who read like Wilderness Survival Guides and Boy Scouts that uh, you never want to eat a polar bear's liver because it's so high in protein that instead of, you know, building those great gains, it's uh, it's going to kill you. I think That's it's vitamin high in A. It is. Oh, okay. I mean, it's vitamin A. Yeah, but something, something about uh, polar bear liver is deadly. Uh, also, uh, you were talking this before the episode, Sam. Apparently, polar bears have black skin. Uh, who knew? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of like three polar bear facts I know, so I cherish it with all my heart. <laughs> uh, the other polar bear fact I know is that they are insanely aggressive because they didn't evolve yeah. alongside humans for nearly as long as most other types of bears. So they just don't yeah. have the instinct to avoid humans because bears, they're generally pretty smart. They don't really want a confrontation. They're mostly chill unless they're like yeah. in a very desperate state. But polar bears, they will fuck you up. I know in yeah. uh, well, yeah. in, um, in some towns in Norway, they have laws on the books saying that if you go outside, you have to bring a gun with you in case you run into a polar bear and it attacks you because otherwise yeah, you're, no, no, yeah. you're mincemeat. Yeah. Uh, I know a guy, uh, he's Inuit, he lives in northern Alaska, very far north, and they have a polar bear siren because every so often a Nanook comes to the village and they have to put the siren on to stop people from getting chomped. Yeah, I'm glad I'm not far north enough to deal with polar bears. <laughs> So I'm I'm glad about that. What do you get mooses at least? Uh yeah, like I've seen like I've seen a couple foxes. I haven't seen a moose. Like I know there are moose out here because people like have offered me moose. Um so they definitely hunt moose, but I haven't seen any moose just walking around. Um and I definitely haven't seen any bears, but from what I understand they're still hibernating. Like I think they said they come out of hibernation here soon. Which makes me nervous about walking around because I like to go on walks like every day. Mm -hmm. But now I'm like, what? Like, is there going to be a bear that's going to eat me if I go out on a walk? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. I've got, you know, I can close this off with one very tiny, very recent uh, Alaska bear story. But before we do, uh, first off, thank you so much, John, for coming on to chat about Alaska. This is all very new to me. Um, I yeah. just knew a little bit about Togo, but that's it. Uh, Anything else you want to share? Any other stories or little anecdotes about Alaska, things you've observed in your time there so far? Um, I guess just like one other little tidbit about Alaska is because I hadn't really known about it, but I guess there was like a big aerial war between Japan and the U.S. during World War II um, because I, I knew that like the Japanese occupied a couple islands and – um, basically like one of the guys I've met here, like he keeps telling me, like, he's like an older guy. Um, and he t has just told me a lot of stories about people that like survived like air raids, um, from when the Japanese were bombing. Um, so that was kind of a crazy thing to learn about. Whoa. So there was, oh, right. Because the, the Aleutian Islands had the, only, I believe oh, wow. the only conflict on U.S. soil in World War II. Yeah. Besides Pearl Harbor. That's crazy. Yes. That is so crazy. I haven't read the book yet, but if you guys want to read a book about it, there's a book called The Thousand Mile War that's like now on my reading mm. list because the guy was telling me about it. And I was like, I definitely want to read about that. All right. Well, John, is there anything you'd like to plug? Um, yeah, actually, there is one Please. thing. I haven't been like putting much on it in the past couple months, but like I do have a sub stack as annoying as that is. No, um, but, and I, I plan on putting stuff on it 
again. Um, so it's dfg.substack.com. Um, so if anybody wants to check that out, uh, I've been writing like a novella for probably too long. Like it's been like a year now that I've been writing it, but it's almost finished now for real. Oh, wow. Like I'm writing the last part. Um, so Great. if anybody wants to read it, um, and then also just random ramblings that I kind of do whenever I feel like it. Um, so if people want to read that, then check All right, it out. Well, that'll be in the show description. Yeah, I'll put that in. I'll put it, uh, you know, John, I have one story to close off, one little Alaska story. But before I get there, uh, I understand you're also working on something called The Bible, too. Would you be comfortable talking oh, about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's mainly a joke. Uh, I mean, I guess, like, it started uh-huh. off, like, this is kind of embarrassing, but, I mean, basically it started off when I was, like, genuinely going, like, a little bit cuckoo. But now now it's, like, mainly yeah. just uh, a tell joke. Tell me about it, yeah. COVID. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I mean, it's like half a joke and then half something that might actually work out, but it's basically uh-huh. like, I'm going to write a book and then I need other people to write books for it. So I guess if people want to contribute to the Bible too, then like, yeah, let, yeah. Let you're, the, you're the apostle John, the apostle yeah. John too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, uh, John. And here's the last little story that uh, you might know, and I think you might know, Sam, too. I just think it's very funny. Uh, You mentioned Kodiak, Alaska earlier for a terrible reason uh, for the massacre led by the Russians, you know, uh, Russian settlers uh, in Alaska. There was one other time that an outsider came to Kodiak, Alaska. Uh, It's a much more positive encounter. And that is the time that uh, a certain Miami-based rapper... Uh, who is best known as Pitbull, did an online poll to see what next city would have his concert. And so, you know, people were voting Atlanta, Seattle, Miami. But uh, a a well-intentioned campaign starting by people in the city of Kodiak, Alaska, said, no Pitbull, come to Kodiak. And then a bunch of, you know, classic early 2010s online pranksters thought it'd be really funny to share the poll and all vote in it. And eventually... Pitbull, dis- Pitbull saw that he had to come to Kodiak, Alaska. So to his credit, he did. And he actually, it was a really big deal for the town. He was probably the first major musician to ever perform there. because it's a very small town, just a few thousand people. And the only venue that was suitable for holding everyone in town was the Walmart. So Pitbull played a concert for basically the entire town of Kodiak, Alaska. Like a thousand people or more showed up in the Walmart to hear him perform and uh, he performed right underneath a giant stuffed grizzly bear. Yeah, I remember uh, when this happened, it was really funny. It was a great prank, and uh, he really took it to heart. He seems like yeah, a no, very it, genuine guy. Yeah. Um, uh, but it really just boggles the mind to think that there are probably people listening to this podcast who probably didn't even hit puberty when uh, when that happened <laughs> yeah maybe so yeah yeah all right well they, with that uh, that concludes our alaska talk john if you ever want to come on again to chat about alaska or anything please do this has been great. yeah yeah i definitely i had fun doing I, this is my podcast debut so i mean i had fun doing it so all right well yeah let's bring you back on sometime and russian sam as always thank you for joining me this has been gladio for europe We will be back very soon with a discussion about another place very far from Alaska, but still in the Americas. We are going, I think, for the first time next week to the Southern Hemisphere. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm. Stay tuned. Bye-bye.
once again, Cody, I want to say thank you so much for having us out here.